Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. This is Chamber Chats, and I am the CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce, coming to you, as always, from the podcasting studios at Czech Television. I would like to begin, as always, by acknowledging that I live and work in the unceded ancestral territories of the Lekwungen-speaking nations, the Songhees and the Esquimalt. Chamber Chats made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union, and C-SPAN Victoria Shipyards. We're back to in-person events at the Chamber of Commerce. We're getting people together to listen to uh, speakers at lunchtime, and we have evening gatherings that are going on. We had one a short time ago that was a very compelling session with a lot of questions and a lot of feedback with my guest today, who's been with us on Chamber Chats before. Johnny Morris is the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association for British Columbia. Johnny, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me back, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. We're talking about mental health in general. I mean, our our lives now have had accelerated mental health challenges throughout the pandemic, workplace being no exception. But so just your organization in general, what are you hearing from people who do reach out to your organization concerning their own mental health? Um, Throughout the pandemic, we've we've seen a a big increase in, in reaching out for advocacy and support. So people who are in the system. They're they're either advocating for care or or needing to 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 find support and resources. We're hearing more and more about those challenges. Um, we actually had a big provincial summit about that just yesterday. And in our services, Bruce, we offer a range of accessible services for low mood, depression, stress, anxiety. Uh, we've absolutely seen an increase in people, families, parents, caregivers, workers. Uh, reaching out for both our services, but also our educational resources and training. Um, it's it's. I've been at this for a long time, Bruce, and just to see the level of of need and urgency and interest, um, it's profound um, given the point of time that we're at. Yeah, we're going to go over some kind of alarming stats and some data uh, with you in just a couple of minutes. But, you know, something that you and I have spoken about before, um, there are still people who feel that there's some stigma attached to, uh, to talking about or admitting that they had had mental health challenges. So in that spirit, I have been very forward about the fact that I had some challenges a number of years ago, just through a bunch of circumstances in my life. I just felt very dull and lethargic and had been through some life trauma. Um, went for counseling, was determined I had a, a low degree of depression, and I went on antidepressants and continued to seek counseling. It straightened me out, and I'm fine now. So I'm going to tell that story and encourage others to, it's, it's not showing a weakness, it's showing great bravery when you, when you make those statements like that. But um, what sort of advice are you, are you giving to people? You, you mentioned the resources that you have available. Um, everybody's circumstance is different though, right? I mean, the, the way that they react to the things around them, the anxiety, the fear, the anticipation, the even some anger, you hear it all and see it all. So what, what do you tell people when they speak to you about this? Um, well, I think I think the really important thing to do is is um, given the diversity of experience around mental ill health or mental health or substance use, um, there isn't a one size fits all there. And, and I think for for people who are on the receiving end of supporting someone, it's just so critical to 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 listen um, because, as you just said a few moments ago, Bruce. Um, stigma is, is still alive and well in our workplaces, in our health system, in our communities, in our schools. Um, you know, would you 10 years ago have been comfy sharing that on air? Um, I, as you know, I've been, you know, only recently in this role being open about my experience of depression. And so I, I think, you know, one of the key things is, is not so much that what we would tell people, but, but really listening and, and holding the space, whether you're a supervisor, a boss, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor. Um, I can't emphasize just how important it is for someone who's, who's taken that step to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I'm, I'm worried about my mental health. To really listen to them in that moment is, is really a pathway, hopefully, to care and support. Yeah, we hear all the time, I hear personally from our chamber members and others who are very concerned about the well-being of their family, their friends, their workers, and especially people who are in a position of responsibility uh, as an owner or a manager. They feel that they have this responsibility to be the best they can be for the people that they work with or the people that work for them. Have you seen any particular sectors of the economy that have been t- touched by, I mean, it's touched everybody, but is it more severe in any particular areas? Healthcare, I'm thinking, has probably had a pretty big yeah. uptick. Well, healthcare, and, and there's a, a, a group of us um, across the province who for some time have, have been concerned about 
um, the the psychological or the mental health impacts of, of both the pandemic and also life before the pandemic, um, and 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 the impact that that's had upon um, healthcare worker mental health, and and we could do a whole series of podcasts podcasts on that with our colleagues with you, Bruce. Tourism, the service industry, and and tourism hospitality. Uh, we we were given resources by the the province, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. Because early on in the pandemic, much like healthcare, there was there was a recognition by the province and others that those sectors had been hard hit on many levels, um, both livelihoods, so the worries about will I be able to make ends meet, will I have a job, um, but also you know we've we've heard from businesses here in Victoria about about the stresses of being in the service industry uh, with with shortages of staff and also the pressures of being you know in frontline service with folks. And then agencies like ours, community social services, um, you know, have, have really, um, you know, borne the brunt of, of lots of, of stress and worry. But you know, the point you made was really important, Bruce, that I think the pandemic has shown us that we all have a relation, we all have a, a relationship to mental health, we, we've all been impacted in some way. Um, and in, in many ways, the pandemic has shone a light on um, the toll that situations like a pandemic can can have upon mental health and well being. Yeah, people have found different ways to sort of manage their stress as best they can. You, for example, uh, brought some bliss into your own life because you got married very recently. Yes. And, and you brought yes. that joy into your life, which is pretty cool. You got yes. mar you're married in your own backyard, right? Yes, yes. Joy at home, Bruce. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so speaking of home, this whole work from home thing is a thing. I mean, it's, it's here to stay. Um, initially, people were staying at home, working from home, cowering, afraid, unclear on what was going to be happening. So what were the impacts of that working at home model, both for the bad side and the good side of it? I mean, there's been an upside to it as well, but what what does that whole dynamic look like going forward? Well, some of the research we've done with um, UBC actually, and, and others has, has kind of painted a, a picture of how um, the impacts of that kind of massive upheaval and how we do work has, has impacted different people in, in different ways. And so, you know, people who are, are caregivers or parents and, and who had to kind of reassemble many times routines around raising kids, um, supporting elders, supporting loved ones. Um, you know, what we saw particularly there, parents, caregivers, uh, women particularly, was that there was a there was a profound impact upon mental health and well-being. Um, young people, and, and I think you asked me this the other day, uh, learning environments kind of turned upside down the school year. And whilst there were lots of efforts, I think, to preserve a, a sense of normalcy, um, all the things that we'd grown used to around routine and predictability shifted in, in huge ways during the pandemic. So young people, people in school were, were impacted in, in different ways. And we, we saw that in the data we've collected. But you mentioned the upside. I mean, for, for many, um, working from home um, financially made a lot of sense. They weren't spending as much commuting, getting to the office. There was a greater sense of autonomy and control over uh, your own routine in your life. And we hear that with our staff here at the Canadian Mental Health Association. It's had some real benefits and People have felt isolated, disconnected from teams, um, trust, accountability. All those things have also kind of been been um, experienced too by the workforce, I think, Bruce. And there were, of course, all those people that all through the pandemic had to go to work. They were part of essential services. Yeah. So there was that added level of stress in there as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So what I want to talk about next is now that we're returning to the workplace, what does that look like and how does it feel? Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Johnny Morris, who is the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association for British Columbia. So people now going back into the workplace, wherever it is that they may be, some are going back full-time, some are part-time, but that dynamic is a bit of a challenge for some people because a lot of people are a completely different human being than they were two and a half years ago. So they're coming back to see other people who are different human beings than they were two and a half years ago. Let's talk about that process of people reintegrating themselves back in. Well, what you're saying is so is so important, right? So we've all changed, we've adapted. Um, I often use this word of, of feeling atomized, like we're atoms as, as parts of our teams, we're kind of distributed. Um, and so catching up with each other, knowing that we've we've changed in, in different ways as we've worked remotely is, is something we have to adapt to and recognize. 
And in many ways, culture, the, the cultures that exist in our workplaces have also changed significantly and, and, and adapted accordingly. So I think the theme, you know, I, I see as a leader in my workplace, when I hear my colleagues describe, um, is is there is a we are in a time of continued adaptation right and ch and change and it's unprecedented i mean at least speaking from my own uh, perspective you know to be thinking through hybrid these terms hybrid work from home return to office um even managing hybrid meetings that we managed a few last week where you've got people online people in the space some entities and organizations have been doing this for years but it's really reached the, the general uh, workplace in lots of ways. And so I think that there's adaptation, there's adjustment. Um, you know, some are, some folks are trepidatious about what this means. Some are resistant. Um, and we are kind of moving into, you know, a, a different era now of, of, of adaptation to different ways of working with each other. Um, and that brings with it both opportunity and I think some real implications around mental health and well-being. Throughout the pandemic, we have seen mental health challenges on full open display as people were having episodes on the streets and in stores and disgruntled customers losing their temper over things or people who are experiencing an overdose or or have been dealing with managing their own mental health. And that can be very intimidating for people who are witnessing that, even for somebody who might be confronted by someone who's having that sort of an episode. What advice do you have for someone who is approached by or involved with someone who's experiencing that kind of challenge? Um, well, one thing I might say first before offering some advice, there was a great comment in the, the event we did last week, Bruce, um, around um, workplace mental health and remembering that um, people people can, can have a, a very stress-based reaction. They might be angry. They might be very stressed. They might be very nervous, worried. And it, it have nothing to do with a, a mental health diagnosis per se. And then there are folks who are experiencing symptoms of distress, symptoms of crisis, maybe um, symptoms related to a mental health problem or a substance use problem and, and how we grapple with that. So fundamentally, you know, one of the first things to do irrespective of the reason is to, of course, make sure you're safe and, and make sure, you know, you're, you're in a comfy spot. But to to respond with with care, compassion, and empathy, and so the first step I've often used is to, to is to ask um, a question like how how are you doing? What's happening for you right now? To signal care and concern, you know, to ask, uh, to listen, you know, uh, to create space for people who are in that space of distress is so invaluable, as I said earlier, and then to find ways to um, secure help for that person, which might be calling a helpline for support. Um, we're launching new crisis teams very shortly in Victoria. Maybe maybe those teams are part of the resource picture. But asking and listening and helping, you know, are three things. And we taught those three basic skills to a whole range of small businesses a few weeks ago in Victoria. Um, and my sense is that those skills were, were received really warmly, you know, by the people who attended that session. So that is something that CMHA can do, right? You can get in front of workplaces and, and, and supervisors and guide them to to better manage those circumstances. There's a term that the organization uses called, well, the term is psychological safety. Mm. Tell me what that is. Yeah, so um, psychological safety uh, can mean a lot of different things to, to people, but it, in many ways, it's it's the idea that that employers have a responsibility to put in place um, measures and practices and procedures that not only ensure your physical safety, like you know you're not going to hit a hazard or be electrocuted or be hurt at work, but that also um, your your mental health and well-being is going to be protected and taken care of. So that means you know making sure that our workplaces are free of bullying or harassment. You know, people feel, you know, accountable, but if they make a mistake, they're not going to be punished or humiliated, um, that people can speak up and, and um, raise a concern or share a perspective without feeling um, that they're, they're going to be, um, you know, make the boss upset. Um, so psychological safety is a kind of lots of those kinds of features, but it's it's really about supporting full participation of, of workers and staff and leaders in their workplaces. Your three pillars of strategic plan are reach, uplift, and advance. Tell mm. me about that. Yeah, we, we've just set a new North Star vision. And um, as, as, the, as a provincial mental health organization, 
uh, we really wanted to um, reach as many people as possible and really reach the diversity of people across the province and across Victoria, being that we offer service here. And workplaces are a really key part of that, like really in reaching as many employers as possible, as many sectors, as many industries, and being a partner, someone who can walk along um, those businesses and employers. And we're, we're doing this in lots of ways right now as much as possible. Uplifting is so key, and, and recently we've been doing really significant work with people with lived and living experience. We, we often refer to folks with lived and living experience as peers, and we've been really involving um, folks with lived experience to help redesign the system. We've done some focus work on crisis care, so we're really trying to uplift the voices of people who have experienced the system or their own problems um, to, to help chart a better way forward. And advance is really, I think, about holding um, holding ourselves accountable and holding um, governments accountable and holding each other accountable about really achieving mental health as a universal human right, that, that we need to, to measure what we're doing and we need to get better at what we're doing to push the pendulum for change. You have some uh, fairly alarming stats that sort of relate mental illness to disability. You know, but you, you know, if you've ever felt that that fear, that paralyzing feeling of stress or, or, or anxiety, whatever it might be, tell me about that. The disability stat that uh, aligns with a relationship to mental health. Yeah. So we during the during the pandemic, and, and there's a number of, of linked uh, data in some ways, Bruce. Uh, what we what we noticed in the pandemic is is um, people living with a disability. Um, were among some of the hardest hit by um, the pandemic from a mental health perspective. And so um, racialized folks, uh, people of color, people living with a disability um, really reported in, this, in the surveys we did that their mental health had been impacted the most when compared to other populations. If we think about the heat dome last year as well, just to insert that into the conversation, like we're faced with this, this existential threat. And, and often we think about climate change making us sad, worried, depressed, anxious. And that's very true. There's actually terms like eco-anxiety. But last year in the heat dome, a significant number of the lives that were lost in that mass casualty incident were, were people living with mental illness. There was a significant number, um, uh, two thirds living with a chronic illness or a mental illness. And so again, um, disability or ongoing illness being a, a factor of risk uh, when it comes to climate change. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I think are really important to think through around um, mental health, disability, well-being when it comes to strategy, planning, programming, services, and supports, Bruce. Yeah, it's when when disability reports or claims are filed, health claims, right? The involvement of of mental health in the, I mean, that's that's astounding. Tell me a bit more about well, that. Well, totally, and that's and that's another aspect related to to, to long term disability or short term disability. Um, there's 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 definitely striking statistics where um, you know the proportion of claims in WorkSafe, for example, that are that are mental health related are are on the increase. We we hear that from WorkSafe and other partners too, um, and they often result in in uh, longer amounts of time off and and greater cost, um, both to the person who's making the claim, um, but also to employers and the overall system itself. And so. Um, Circling back to your earlier question, the more we can do as employers to prevent um, a, a disability claim related to, to mental health or substance use, uh, the better for everyone in the long run. We want to talk again about uh, the age factor in this, so we're going to do that next. Johnny Morris is our guest today on Chamber Chats. He is the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association for British Columbia. You spoke a little earlier on in this session about younger people. Uh, I've had some people say that among the angriest and most frustrated outbursts they've seen from people are from seniors because mm -hmm. all of this, the pandemic, their expectation of things has been hugely impacted. What do you hear about that? Well, I, I think I, I've heard less on that front, Bruce, but probably just by virtue of, 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 of who, who your members are and your connection to them in many ways. Um, and you'll see this in our plan for action going forward. Um, there hasn't been huge amounts of attention on, on seniors' mental health. And there are agencies out there, I can think of a number across BC, who are doing such important work um, in and around um, seniors' mental health. It, it's often uh, not the first thing that comes to mind. 
Um, and the pandemic, grief, bereavement, loss, a whole range of things means that we should be paying lots and lots of attention to um, getting the right care, right support, right navigation to, to seniors. And, and we've had conversations with a number of folks about that. Um, you know, I think I think thinking through the implications of loneliness and isolation on mental illness, and not to say all seniors are isolated and lonely, but of course there are populations who 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 are um, amongst seniors. Um, thinking through supporting seniors to navigate um, housing is is an issue. That, housing security is an issue that's affecting more and more seniors each year across um, communities in this province. So I'm so glad you raised that because I think seniors were very very hard hit by loss through the pandemic and 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 illness, um, and and it behooves all of us to find ways to support seniors with their mental health and well being going forward. It's, it's just as important as any other population. Yeah, they can sometimes be a bit resistant uh, resistant to change, right? Old, debit, old habits die hard, and that's a factor too. And trying to find ways to, you know, find ways to get support to senior populations that are accessible and, and responsive and, and appropriate for, for seniors to engage with is also a big part of the challenge. Yeah, and just to wrap it up here, I've noticed some stuff online, on social media, people talking about watching disturbing things on you know Netflix or a movie, or there's a series now about Jeffrey Dahmer, which apparently is really disturbing, really upsetting, and people are putting themselves through that. We have to be careful and have a filter on what we consume, right, to, to, to partake of culturally so that we're not making things worse for ourselves. Yeah, there's a whole a whole debate, I think, uh, around the vicarious um, impacts of a whole range of things, not only um, shows like the one you've described, um, but the consumption of social media, and, and that's often attracted a lot of controversy around um, how, for example, young people perceive themselves when when they they are seeing, um, you know, representations on Instagram, for example. Um, but also, I think we've often said, you know, we we don't want people to not read or watch the news. Like the news is so critical to being informed about what's happening in the world. But as you just said, Bruce, measuring consumption, there's a lot happening in the world right now. There's a war. There's um, hurricanes. There's there's all sorts of things that, you know, can have a, an impact upon mental health and well-being. So measuring our consumption, being smart about what we consume, also being critical about what we're consuming, is super important for for balance and mental health. The Canadian Mental Health Association is there and here to assist anyone who's having issues with their mental health, and you can reach them online through their website, of course. Johnny Morris is the CEO of CMHA for British Columbia. Johnny, thanks for your time and your guidance as always. Thanks so much for your questions, Bruce. And that's it for today. I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chats.